Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's Dealer on Webinar, a tale of two case studies, driving lucrative dealership strategies with data. My name is Eliana Raggio, and I'll be your moderator today. Today's webinar is being presented by Dealer on. For anyone who isn't familiar with Dealer on, we're an award-winning website development company and digital agency, best known for our amazing SEO, the best customer service, and the highest converting website designs in the industry, including the award-winning Chameleon Responsive Website Platform. We're so committed to lead conversion, optimization, and customer service that DealerOn is still the only company in the industry that offers a money-back lead guarantee program. Does your website company guarantee you a 50% lift in leads or your money back? Maybe you should check us out at our gorgeous brand new DealerOn website at DealerOn.com. Oh, I also want to let you know that Sean Rains and Greg Gifford will be both presenting at the upcoming Driving Sales Executive Summit at the Bellagio in Las Vegas. So if you're going to be there, stop by, check them out, and say hi. Can't wait to see you there. We have a great show in store for you today. We're very pleased to have the one and only Brent Weiss as our presenter today. Brent Weiss is the Director of First Impressions at Next Up and has been a fixture in the Canadian automotive digital landscape for the past 15 years. A regularly featured speaker at automotive events around the world, Brent's energetic, comedic, and uniquely engaging presentation style keeps him in demand at events such as Women in Automotive, Driving Sales Executive Summit, World Shopper, Innovation Dealer Summit, and the Canadian Auto Dealer Innovation Series, just to name a few. He's a regular contributor to Auto Retail Network Magazine, UK, Canadian Auto World Magazine, and Canadian Auto Journal. And he believes if you really want to grow in the auto industry, you have to hashtag do one thing different today. Brent Weiss has an affinity for cool hats and hot grilled cheese sandwiches. He can be reached at bweiss at thenextup.com. Oh, by the way, Brent Weiss will also be presenting at the upcoming Driving Sales Executive Summit in Vegas next week, where he'll be talking about why marketing to millennials is for suckers. So if you're going to be yeah, there, you'll definitely want to check it out. Now, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the question feature located on the corner of your screen to submit them. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer those questions of general interest. If we're unable to get to your question live, we're going to try to respond by email later today. Also, don't forget, a link to download a copy of this webinar recording is going to be emailed to you later today for your reference. And hey, feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. Oh, guess what? Our good friends at Next Up, they're giving away an awesome prize today on the webinar. Two of you lucky webinar attendees are going to win a Gorin Brothers virtual hat shopping trip with the hat expert himself, Brent Weiss. I'm officially jealous of whoever scores this cool prize. You have to be on the live broadcast to win it, though, so stay tuned. And who knows, you could be one of the people walking away with this awesome prize today. Also, at the conclusion of the webinar, you're going to get a short survey, so fill it out. We're always looking for quality feedback from our audience. We want to hear what you have to say about today's presentation. And hey, do you tweet much? We hope you do. We'd love to see what you have to say about today's presentation, so please tag us in it. You can use hashtag DealerOnWebby. I'm at Eliana Raggio. You can also hit up Brent Weiss at, <laughs> you guessed it, Brent Weiss. We look forward to seeing what you're saying. So let's get started. Let's listen to a tale of two case studies driving lucrative dealership strategies with data. Brent, or as I like to call you, B-Dub, how you doing? I'm fantastic. Thank you, Eliana. I'm so glad everyone's taken the time to join us today, you know, with the exception of Brad Paschal from Texas. <laughs> Oh my God! But stop! Stop! Said, I want to just let everyone do... know. I swear, it took me I'll two years to finally get him on my show, and I know he is going to be nice to everyone. I'm going to be nice to everyone except you're, for Brad. You're Canadian. You don't have I it in you. <laughs> no, I know. We're we're super polite, and what I what I want to do today is with these case studies. It, it's pretty cool because I've taken a dealership from Texas and one from Canada. Uh, from so Brad's home state and one from my home province, of Ontario, oh. and we're gonna we're gonna look at how uh, those strategies evolve through data, and we're gonna talk about a few things today. But the objectives of today's webinar are we're gonna show you how the stores adopted new technology, but how also they overcame hurdles, and and how to take those experiences back to your dealership. I want to I want to share and show how business intelligence provided. Um, the technology allowed the stores to quiet their staff's engagement tactics. And when I, this is a, a session that I like to call quiet is the new loud because what technology is doing for stores is it's allowing people to focus on things and we'll get into that in a second. But then um, just learning how that also dramatically quieted other marketing strategies. So 
while certain technologies are being employed by stores for specific tasks. Sometimes when you, when you invest in them and you take the time to allow them to bake in, I'm going to show you a couple of learnings that both stores came out with that weren't necessarily um, part of the um, quote unquote like the sales pitch of the vendor to, to the store. And then, like you said, we're going to give away a really cool uh, couple of virtual Goren Brothers hat shopping trips with me. So, you know, if you're a, if you're a baseball cap fan or you've got a vacation coming up, you want to get a sun hat, or you know, you're like Kevin Fry, like wearing big frilly lady hats, you can come with me and we can get you a hat if you win the prize. So, you know, there's going to be question and answers too that Eliane is going to run with us. We're going to jump into this, and if, for those of you who've been to my sessions before, we're going to take 20, 25 minutes to blow through this stuff and then we'll get into uh, some interactive stuff and some Q&A. So Eliana, can I, can I keep rolling or do you want to add anything to what uh, I'm going to No, I just want to tell the about. audience, make sure you get those questions in and don't be afraid to tweet out all of this awesomeness as well. All right, Brent, take it away. Where do we begin? All right, we're going to jump into this. So like I said, this is a session that I like to call Quiet is the New Loud. And really when you're what this is all about is following the signs and, and looking at the signs that are happening inside our stores, looking at the signs that come in via our marketing, either digitally or, or um, digitally or traditionally. And when you when you think about it, you see our our, our, our marshal with her quiet sign up front. And the and I start this session because the reason why I like this sign is because a quiet sign at a golf tournament does a lot of work and it's a very simple execution. You see that marshal holds up the sign and it allows the golfer to focus, right? The sign goes up, the marshal holds up the sign and hundreds of people see that sign and they immediately know they have one thing to do and that is lower their voices, kill the noise, and then the golfer, it, the sign allows the golfer to do one thing that he has to do on that tee box and that is simply make the best shot he possibly can either from the tee box or from the fairway. So it's an interesting thing that, you know, it's a lo-fi, that quiet please sign is a lo-fi tool to do a lot of work for the marshal and for the golfer themselves. And I want to take that thinking into the dealership because really what I, what I help dealers figure out and what we talk about as a group being vendors and dealers alike is, you know, what, what is the goal of our store? And there's some dealer math that I sort of, you know, simplified based on talking to some of my peers, like, like the dealers out there, like Brad in Texas or like Kevin at Weiler. There's, there's just things that the dealers focus on all the time. And, the math that I've created in terms of the entire operation is that it's, it's based on what we want. Um, it's based on what do we want for the store from a traffic sense, what do we want from the store from a lead sense, what do we want the store from a return sense. And, and that math is simply this, is all stores want more traffic. It, it's quite simple. And more traffic equals more leads. More leads equals more opportunity and thus more opportunities equal more profit. Um, it's, it's a very simple funnel and it's not hard to get there. Um, so again, when we look at that, we want traffic, those traffic are opportunity, those leads, those leads turn into opportunities and that's profit. And based on that math, <laughs> you know, what do dealers usually do? And, and it's quite simple what they do is that we spend, right? We spend to get that traffic, we spend to get those leads and we keep spending we spend a little bit more and we keep spending. And that's the phenomena of that math is we, we keep pushing dollars at this in, in a somewhat blind sense a lot of times. We, you know, we'll go out and we'll just throw money at it. And you know, sometimes we have success with that strategy of you know, let's throw money at the market, let's throw money traditionally and digitally out there to get this traffic in. Sometimes we have success with that and sometimes we're throwing money at different platforms to help us inside and out of the business. We have success with that, but sometimes, you know, it, it, we get lost and sometimes we, we pull the chute. And what I mean by that is we may go out to market with marketing dollars. We may go into our stores investing in technology to help our processes and our people move through a consumer journey better. But if we're throwing money at a lot of things and we're not really investing the time nor the sense to really dig into them and look at them, sometimes we're pulling the chute and we're walking away from technology. And in some cases, that technology, if you allow it to bake in and, and drive adoption top down, you actually come away with some really great insights that can help you evolve your business. 
but again, we live in this very quick turnaround of, you know, if in 30 or 60 days this isn't happening for us, let's, let's just abandon it. So again, while we're spending, um, it's, it's not always the best thing, and, and by what I mean is by pulling the chute, we're not learning and not taking the time. And again, I don't want dealers to go out and spend money on just on everything. Again, it's, it's about being educated and diligent and trying to find the right tools and the right methodology inside and outside of the store to do the best job for us. But we also overwhelm our dealership when we do all this spending. It, there's an exercise I've done in the past where I've, I've had people up at my live sessions, but we overwhelm our dealership when we spend this way because when we think about it, we do a knee jerk where we have traffic being generated for our store and then people in the store feel through their guts that we're not getting enough traffic to the store, hence we're not creating enough leads, not creating enough opportunities, and our profit's down. So when all this spending happens, we do overwhelm our dealership. And what I mean by that is if we are sending too much traffic into the store and we're either not ready for it or we haven't adopted a process to handle it the right way, we we get disjointed and things start to break down. And you know, one of the things that we hear in our stores and even on the vendor side is you need to multitask better. And I believe this is a bit of an epidemic in the industry because we expect of our staff to handle just this monumental flood of traffic that may come in based on all of this spending, but our staff breaks down because they are trying to multitask. And the, and the data really is, is 98% of us actually can't multitask. You know, it's scientifically proven that people can't multitask. Our, our brains aren't wired to do multiple things at the same time. There's a singleness of purpose that has to happen, and we can flow through that very easily if we have one thing at a time to concentrate on. It's like that quiet please sign at the golf tournament. The sign goes up, people know to do one thing. The golfer knows to do one thing, and that sign is successful. That's why it's so successful, because it's only asking people to do one thing. And when we're at the dealerships, we're asking our staff to pick up the phone, talk to customers, get into the CRM, get out front and talk to customers, take those leads and manage them the right way. And in some cases, we're, we're, you know, we're killing our staff through, you know, through the efforts of trying to multitask. So far, so good? So far, great. We're yeah. already starting to get some so, questions in. So audience, keep great. those questions rolling. Fantastic. And so why I put this up, why, why do we do this? And what I mean is why are we throwing so much money and thinking through our gut? Because when this happens, we create chaos. And instead of having that sign go up, we treat our sales floor and our dealership and our departments like an NCAA basketball tournament where we're, all we're doing is just creating greater distractions. We are not quieting the processes and allowing people to focus in on what they're good at. We are creating chaos by this overspend or this over, you know, this overdrive to get more traffic and more leads into the store. It, it in fact is hurting us. We're not allowing people to focus in on singleness of purpose and moving through their customer journey and their customer experience the right way from any department. So what I suggest is, is that we quiet the process. And I believe that through technology, in technology that is providing good data and easy to execute adoption across dealership, we can quiet the process and we can actually improve things for the dealership. We can actually help management teams move and build better business decisions based on the fact that they've got data that they can really use. It's not confusing, but also that it's allowing things to bake in. And that's what this session is all about today is these case studies where two dealerships invested in automated technology and how that quieted their process. In case study number one, so we'll jump into it, is all about Aurelia Hyundai up in Canada. So Aurelia Hyundai is up here in Canada. It's a five-year-old dealership, and it's located in a small town in the mid-north region of Ontario. So if you, for those that are in, know where Toronto, Ontario is, you know, this is, this is maybe two hours out from Ontario, and it's in a small community, and they have a very small database. But they are a progressive store, so they, you know, they try to use the things they learn at the shows and at webinars like these, like different tools and different tactics they, they try to use. So why they looked at automated marketing and automated technology was because they wanted to take more control of retention marketing. They wanted to work their database a little bit better 
And one of the things they saw was they were paying third-party agencies a lot of money to execute twice a year in terms of retention marketing tactics, but with minimal results. They were really hitting their database hard, spending a lot of money, but they weren't getting a lot back. Part of their need as well was they were seeing that they, they were going outside too much to third parties to the fact that the third party was creating and running the entire event and process of the retention marketing on their behalf and their own staff weren't really as engaged, therefore there was a disconnect with their own customers. Um, and finally, it, like I said, small database, and it was too small to do these big sales. So some of the dealers that are here understand this, that you can go out to a third party to do a private sale or a lease pull-ahead sale, and a third party will come in and they will want to use a big chunk of data. Um, what they wanted to do is they wanted to get down into very small segments of data and move through their database without blowing it out twice a year. They wanted to, to get really um, tactical and, and very nimble. So the software they used was a piece of software called Bumper. Now, just quickly on the software, this session is not about the software they used, but you need a bit of context to understand it so you can see what they went through and how it evolved for them. So Bumper is a retention marketing tool. So if you can see that you've got a third-party agency that does direct mail and email and landing page builds for you and all of this tracking. What Bumper does for the dealerships is they use this because they could, they could control it all themselves. They could use the platform to build campaigns and retention marketing campaigns that they could build internally inside the store, go out to market with it, and then track it very, very succinctly. So that's why they decided on this piece of technology. Again, it also got them to market very, very quickly where working third-party agencies, their campaigns sometimes would take 30 to 45 days to get out the door. With Bumper, they were creating things that they could move out the door within 15 minutes to 30 minutes. It's, it's that simple. Now, the hurdles, though, that came with this was is they almost, they went back, they digressed into old habits because they looked at Bumper as a quick fix solution and something that they could sort of turn on and walk away from and Bumper was going to do everything themselves. And what, some of the things they did right off the bat was they went too big with the data pool for the first campaign. The very thing they wanted to stop doing, they did on their first campaign. They saw how quickly they could go out. They saw how easily the campaigns could track. So they went with a lot of data. And that was a big mistake. They, on the first campaign they went to market with, they didn't involve their sales team as much as they could have. So what I mean by that is they prepped a campaign, a couple of people inside the dealership prepped the first campaign moved it out to market very quickly, but they didn't do just a sales team huddle. You know, I'm sure there's a lot of managers and a lot of people out on this on this webinar and that are watching this that, you know, know for a fact that when they use different technologies or put things out, there's briefings or team huddles where they're like, this is going out, be prepared for these sort of leads coming in. So you've got an uneducated staff and so they didn't contact the customer because the system is providing them hot leads and warm leads based on customer interaction with the campaign materials that are going out. But they didn't contact the customer. They sort of did that, we'll sit back now and let the system do all the work for us, even though they still need to talk to customers and still need to follow up on their leads. So they took that magic bullet approach. And that was really a big hurdle. In their first campaign, they fell on their face, and they fell on their face really hard. So what they did was they did a rebound. And this is important because I think a lot of dealerships out there will go to a show, they'll go to a trade show, and they'll find a piece of technology that they really like and they want to learn, but they get in and this happens to them as well. So what these guys did was the minute that they, they realized that they didn't get the almost the guaranteed results that the company bumper gives them, they did a full regroup. They sat down internally first, and then they sat down externally with the bumper teams and regrouped with those product coaches to understand where they could be segmenting better, what they you know didn't follow in terms of what was um, recommended to them to move out, and they kept learning the nuances of the platform. They worked very closely with their vendor to ensure that they covered all of the places that they fell down on that first campaign. And the other thing they did was they sat down and they built a better briefing schedule to the sales team before using the platform, before the next event went out. So. While they did all this, the, the big learning for them on the regroup was is that they, they were leveraging their data mining and their segmentation better. The tool was still going to do a ton of work for them to allow their salespeople to just follow up and talk to those customers that were identifying themselves as the ones truly in market, but it was only because they, they still had to, as human beings, 
sit around the table and go, okay, this is what we're doing, right? That to to get that in complete adoption of the tool. And when they did this, things quieted for them. So what happened for them was the software assisted in creating uniform communication to the customers. The sales staff started to seeing the benefits of the tool and seeing how quickly they could utilize it to get back out to customers. They worked as a team to create a uniform communication based on these retention campaigns up to the customers. The staff were given direct access to customer engagement tracking that the tool provided and they could work more independently based on who was in store that day and who was taking care of the leads coming in off the retention marketing. Like I said, they were a small store, they have a small team, so it was easy for them to work independently and move this through. Uh, the other thing that really, you know, talking to the sales staff when I was doing sort of my, my interviews on, on what happened and how things worked, the sales staff are telling me that it actually shortened their phone time and their phone messaging with customers because they were sending them a lot of information, they were mining the customer's data and pulling a lot of information ahead of time, so they didn't have to spend a lot of time with their customers going through the, you know, the quote unquote, the usual scripts, the usual tracks. There was a lot of information being shared inside the tool which kept people's time uh, respected and, and down. And then this allowed them to help the customer understand monthly programs better. They didn't have to qualify the customer and go through all of this evaluation, but they could spend time allowing those Hyundai customers to understand the next program and how it could be a benefit for them. And the sales staff said by having that, it was something that they never, they felt they didn't have time to do before. It was always sort of a rush piece once they got them in. The new insights they gained from using this tool were that sales were easier to close as the platform heat map customer engagement with the marketing material. So tools like this, automated technology, when the reporting is done the right way and when the technology is syncing the right way, this tool was giving them those customers that were truly in market based on everything they were touching from filling out that final lead that came into the dealer, but you know they were looking at some customers as well that were touching multiple pieces of the marketing and maybe that's the only thing they weren't doing was filling out a lead form. They can work to that, that customer as a follow-up or a, you know, a polite lead because they were identified as warm. The staff also saw that they were actually doing more deals before they even got into the store because based on the data that was coming through the system, most of the legwork was done over the phone conversations. Again, small centers have the luxury of knowing their customers, knowing their community, so a lot of times the trust is already built in, especially with because this is retention marketing, they know the customers, they know what they like and don't like, so it actually reduced the buying period by 50%. And the coolest thing though was, and it's something that knowing the teams that created this tool and what it was originally used for, retention marketing to your database, these guys actually started using the tool to target desired used vehicles for their lot using the platform tools that were provided for them in there. And knowing Bumper, that wasn't something that you know was ever communicated to customers when they were pitching their wares, for instance, at an expo or being in a dealership. So they were, you know, they have a small pre-owned lot, they can only carry so many vehicles, but they could get very specific about what they wanted to pull into that lot based on using the tool. So their biggest takeaways was is that they reduced their marketing, their retention marketing budgets by 50% annually, which was you know, number one, right? We knew that they're that they're one of their big concerns was they were spending too much money because they were a small store. That dealership though now markets in small batches weekly and bi-monthly to stretch their database. So it allowed them to take their database that was small and cut it up month to month, week to week, you know, by month by by month. But it allows them to stretch the database over the course of the year. And also they're using the platform to plan and Instantly, uh, if they have to call an audible, they can use the tool to get out there into market as well. But the long-term planning of the tool allows them to look at segments ahead of time and see what that sort of customer base would look like at any given time around the year. The way, though, is that they no longer rely on the auction for pre-owned vehicles, which was eye-opening to me. Like It was such a cool thing to hear because I wouldn't have thought in a million years that a retention marketing tool, and, and you know, I'm not on the lot, but these guys, are using the tool, like I said, to pull those used vehicles in so they don't have to drive to the big city and compete with everyone else to overpay for cars at the auction because they're pulling the cars they need by managing and mining their own data. So that was that was huge for Aurelia Hyundai. 
that is case study number one, Eliana. You want to hit them with a poll question? I would like to hit them with a poll question. All right, audience, we have two poll questions for you today. The first one is on your screen now. We'd love it if you get involved with our poll questions. It really lets us know what's happening, not just in your dealership, but as a whole, all over the world. So here's what we need. We need you to answer this question for me. How many times has your dealership brought in new technology that has fallen flat and or was quickly abandoned? Please select one of the following. Do you feel it's not a lot, maybe once or twice that happened, you know? Maybe you feel like it's it was a handful of times, maybe four or five, six times, something like that. How about, oh my gosh, it happens all the time. Uh, fortunately, it hasn't happened yet, or, well, you know what, our dealership just doesn't try new things, so of course it's never happened to us. So, once we get a majority of the votes in, we'll close this poll and share the results, and I am going to ask you guys again in the audience, please send in your questions. We have one more case study to go through, and then we're going to get to the prize giveaway and then the Q&A session. We want to help you find out all the solutions that data can do for your dealership. All right, here we go. How many times has your dealership brought in new technology that's fallen flat and or was quickly abandoned? Once or twice, a handful of times, it happens all the time, it hasn't happened yet, or, well, we don't just try new things, so it never happens to us. All right, here we go. We're going to close this poll, share the results, and audience, thank you so much for getting involved with our poll question today. Sweet. Here we go. 15% of today's audience say it happens to them once or twice, but the majority, 40% of today's audience, say it happened to them a handful of times. About a quarter of today's audience, 25%, says, OMG, it happens all the time. 20% wow. said, fortunately, it hasn't happened yet, and... We have all adventurous people here on the show today because no one said that they don't try new things at their dealership. So, any comments on any of those results? Is that what you were expecting to see? I, I'm, yeah, I think the numbers are pretty accurate. You know, it, it, it is interesting to see that 25% of the crowd that's here, you know, we've got a nice small group, but the fact that 25% said it happens all the time, that's a bit of an epidemic and, and you know, living on the vendor side of the fence, you, you do see it all the time. You see it on your own products, you, you, you know, you hear from it from your peers. Um, and I think, you know, you have to take everything with a grain of salt. There's, there's good platforms and good tech out there. I think every vendor out there is trying to build good products for the benefit and the best case scenario for the dealer. And, you know, every product suite or, or standalone, you're going to have some things that are good and work well and some things that don't. So I think that it happens all the time. You also have to think that um, for sure it's an adoption play and, and not letting the not giving the platform the chance to work. And sometimes it, it is coming out of maybe the data is not being provided the right way. And it's again for those vendors that are on, you know, are we working hard enough to ensure that the simplicity of the results and the ROI that we're providing the dealer and the business intelligence that we're providing them is is easily shared and easily obtained by them, right? It shouldn't be something that we hold back or make it difficult to disseminate. It should be very, very simple. I agree. All right, case study number two. Lay it on us. Case study number two. Yeah, let's jump in. So Lithia Toyota of Abilene is, uh, is a great store and a, and a very interesting uh, case study as well. This store joined Lithia Motors, uh, a huge well-known group back in 2005, and they're in Central Texas. Um, and they are, you know, a, a well-performing store, seven-time winner, Toyota Motor Sales President Award. And, you know, when I looked at their reviews, you know, they, they kill it, right? They've got great reviews, um, impeccable, really, impeccable reviews. And they went to automation because they felt there was a better way to handle their customers. Um, uh, their manager was looking at things, and I think he was seeing that there was a better way to to connect with that customer experience and even get better. And I think that's I think this is a lot, and I know there's a lot of people on the calls, and this isn't a pandering thing, but I, I have a lot of friends on the dealer side in this industry, and I know that a lot of their stores really focus on how can they continue to provide the best content, the best in-store experience, and, and the, the best post-sales experience for the customers. And I think that those managers that are continually looking at that are the ones that are always going to really lead the charge of the best in practice around the country. So he, you know, their manager was looking at that. Um, 
peers in the group, once they joined Lithia Group and they started looking at what other stores were looking at, that you know they were being recommended to use some automated technology to help run the store. Uh, there was a need to have better time management of their people on the floor through the sales process. And they needed a better way to keep sales teams accountable. So they decided to use Next Up um, based on the recommendations from others in their group. And just to preface this for everyone in the in the in the webinar, I started talking to the store prior to joining the company. Um, so it was in, you know, just before we get in, this is a very unbiased look at the product because again, I just asked the general managers to take me through their experience, and this is really what I want to share. The most Curious thing about this store though, the thing that stood out for me and why I wanted to cover it was because of this. When I looked at the stores I wanted to cover, when we were talking about all of that spending that was happening, we spend and we spend and we spend. Ownership at the store got spent $25,000 every month on TV. About the third week of every month it came down the pipes like we don't have enough traffic on the floor. I just, I know it from my gut, we don't have enough going on. Let's get more traffic in and they would dump $25,000 on television, that's that's you know in Canada, that's that's just unheard of. Um, I know budgets are different everywhere, but that's that's massive. You know, for just just a gut check to get more traffic, that's humongous. Next up, as you know, is a sales process tool. What it does is it moves dealerships from an open floor to a managed floor and allows a sales system, a sales team system, where they queue themselves in, they line themselves up, and it really, in a nutshell allows for the staff to organize themselves and hold each other accountable as they're moving through customers in an organized fashion. It allows managers to look at the floor where people are, but it gives back their sales staff the time that they need to either be on point looking at the lot and making sure that people are greeted in a timely fashion and that the people that aren't on point are actually at their desks doing anything from CRM logging to phone follow-ups to appointment setting what this gets stores away from is if you drive by a dealership and 19 guys are standing up front on the lot waiting for an up or you walk into a store and no one greets you at all, then you've got process problems on the floor. And next up is that gap in between from, you know, from curb to glass, how are we best organizing ourselves and putting people out on the floor and then allowing management to sync up with this process and to make sure that test drives and manager intros are flowing the right way. On the back end, what Next Up can do for those dealerships, though, is actually start to give them the right amount of data to go, how much time are we spending with our customers? How many opportunities are we missing? What's happening when we're missing certain test drives or certain manager intros? So again, the tech is simple. The data that it's giving the dealerships is very robust. So their hurdle, um, when I was talking to Keenan at the dealership, his only hurdle was that the entire, entire management team was bought in from the start, so there were no hurdles. They, these are his exact words. I wanted to put them in because it is a hurdle, because he says it here. We just needed to hold staff accountable to what we as a management team decided to accomplish. So that is a hurdle because, you know, there was consensus here before the install, and usually that's done ass backwards. Usually one person will make a decision to bring something into the store sometimes, and then they need to get everyone adopted. So Keenan's team, they actually all agreed to move forward with this as a group, but they still had to hold everyone accountable, and that's where the work comes in. You see, you need it top down. Even though all the management says, yep, we're all gonna do this together, we're gonna hold th things accountable, it still has to happen every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you buy into something, you all have to push together in the same direction. And then sometimes, there is those pain points that you have to get through as a group, a little bit of pain you have to walk through together to get the other side to start really getting home runs using a piece of technology. Their instant insights though with this was the fact that they were now tracking every opportunity that was coming into the dealership, hundreds of opportunities weren't being logged. The platform was showing the dealership that it wasn't a process problem, the store was actually grossly understaffed. So when the when ownership was spending this money at TV, they were they were actually driving a lot of that traffic. But the customer experience that Keenan was seeing that was suffering was because the store was understaffed. They just didn't have the bodies in there. And the customers were not waited on and they were also not being followed up with because of this because people were just too busy trying to balance taking people that were walking in the door while trying to handle things on their desk. And what this automated piece of technology was is helps dealers and their staff focus on just the person they're in front of. So if you're on point, 
you're just dealing with that person on the floor with you. If you're at your desk, then you can focus on those customers you're trying to follow up with. And because they were so understaffed, they were their people were stretched, and it goes back to that multitasking role of they were they were having their people spin too many plates, and things were becoming disjointed very very quickly. So the more that the software started to take hold, and the more that the software was adopted, things did change. Uh, the team started logging almost double the number of customers they were previously because they had desk time to sit down and just focus on CRM log or appointment follow-up. Their engagement was now happening with 25% of those customers that were never spoken to or missed previously. So they already got back some of that retention that they were losing. And creating that rotation amongst the staff meant that the walk-in opportunity was more serious in value. So they weren't allowing their staff en masse to stand out in front of the store and start to qualify people on the dealership's behalf based on how they look or what they drove. You had one person dealing with people coming in one at a time, and everyone was treated equally because of the how they were using the, the data. They were like profiling them? <laughs> well, it happens all the time, and I know that there's dealers out there that know it. Like You, you can drive by any dealership around the country and see scores of people standing out front, taking, you know, looking at the lot, waiting for people to drive in, but then the moment people drive in, they're like, oh, I don't like the way that guy looks, so I'm, I'm going to go disappear now so I don't have to take them. Or, you know, I don't want to waste my time with someone who's maybe looking at a lesser vehicle. You know, maybe it's a Chrysler store and someone's looking, you know, walking the lot looking at a Fiat 500, they're not looking at a Ram truck, so I'm not going to bother with that person. You know, personally, I walked into, a, I walked into an Ottawa dealership couple of weeks ago and you know you had this this veteran sales shark hanging all over the sales desk and the sales desk you know he's sitting behind the desk and I asked for one of the managers and they just sort of half-heartedly directed me to the receptionist in the showroom and as I walked away the sales desk manager under his breath to the other salesperson said um, we're the sales desk and I turned around and said I heard that and immediately started tweeting about my awesome experience with you know you know, they probably thought, oh, here comes some no-good vendor, but who knows, maybe I'm not a no-good vendor. Maybe I've got a check for 10 cars from the fleet manager I need to, like, give him for some business. Again, this happens too often because people are, quote-unquote, too busy to do things at their desk or greet people the proper way. So when the software came in, this is what it sort of combats from a culture standpoint because too many times people are evaluated by staff, and they're doing that on the dealership's behalf, and I can tell you, Talking to the dealers I've talked to, there's operators out there and general managers that don't want that happening. But it's a killer thing that happens, and it's culturally a, just a bad thing, and it will always keep the the um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just that the way the general public looks at the car salesman. If we can start cleaning up and getting to manage floors, oh, then that, that perception. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the perception. Thank you. Yeah, the perception changes, and things get better in the floor and for the customer. Okay, I'm just going to put this out there. I'm going to speak for all car shoppers who ever have driven into a dealership and saw, you know, four, five, ten, twelve guys or, you know, people hanging around the front door. Please don't do that. That's very intimidating. I would just as soon drive right the heck out of that lot. They, we do not like that. <laughs> yeah. You might be getting a smoke or getting some fresh air, but do you have to do it in such large groups? Like one or two? Okay, I think I could handle that. Even yeah. even that's sure. kind of weird because no one stands outside of like Neiman Marcus and like you know attacks you as soon as you get close to the door. You know, I mean, it's just please don't do that. <laughs> it is called you know called or or the other way is you know you you know people that have walked in dealerships and walked like through the showroom and not one person's talked to them and sometimes you know salespeople will be peeking out of their doors looking and going oh I don't really want to deal with that person so I'll go make myself quote unquote busy somewhere else. So again, um, this was like you know some of the things that evolved for the store and changed some of the things culturally for them. Not that this store had those those really bad culture problems, but there was just experience things that were happening that Keenan identified that he wanted to fix. Right. So as things changed for the store, there was high employee turnover, and this is epidemic around the country and in North America, Canada as well. There's always high turnover, so they never knew that some of the some of the law customers better than others. So now they have those insights because everyone their turnover has been reduced because everyone's got a fair shake at new opportunities that are walking into the dealership. They've got more time to do the things at their desk that they need to do and they're not stressed. 
So their employee turnover is quieting, right? It's not happening at such a high rate. Sales staff actually asked management to hire more people because they had to assist with customers at the dealership, freeing them up to do follow-up. So based on the amount of traffic that the store was getting, they still needed more people. And the system was actually showing them that they were understaffed because as people took customers and moved to the down list in the software, the store could see that based per shift where they either needed to like you know, take one staff, move them to the morning or move them to the afternoon, or add more staff to that shift because this, this, that's what the automation in the technology is showing the dealerships is where they're thin or where they've got below. So it quieted for you know for the dealership and, and I know that Keenan from the store hates you hated me using the, the, the term, but it did because when they automated the rotation process, it ensured that staff was providing that organized and efficient customer experience online and offline. And that's what I mean by this tool was allowing the the sales staff to focus on either the work they had to do at their desk and only that or being up front, being ready for someone to walk in through the door and give them that Abilene Toyota experience. It also allowed their, their staff to focus on all customers and not prejudging anyone. So to your point, Eliana, about people standing around the front, no one was being prejudged because what we also know and everyone that's on this webinar knows this as well is that when people are coming into the dealership now, they have done a ton of research. They know what they're looking for, they know the vehicles they're looking for, and they've looked at your dealership. The fact that they're walking in, everyone is very close to convert, and there shouldn't be any prejudgment on anyone walking in. All of those opportunities are equally as important. So those are the things that quieted for the store. And finally, this is the big reveal for these guys, is they reclaimed a lot of dollars. Based on using the tool, they canceled all their television advertising. So Wait, that big spend. Yeah, and I'll get to that in a second, but they canceled it because that television advertising was happening, like I said, gut spend, third week of every month was happening, and they canceled that advertising. And it opened up dollars for new hires. See, not it's not that they canceled it for good, but they didn't need to drive more customers into the showroom. They needed to focus on what they had. They had solid, healthy traffic to the showroom. So they could turn on the advertising as targeted when needed. So if down the road the data is showing them that their traffic is low because the tool is going to give them that insight, then they can use data to make a business decision to go, let's put some money behind television because right now we can see we're trending. And next up, the platform itself, and these are the things that I'm learning as I've been 60 days on the platform as well, is it will show you how you're trending and that will allow you to actually make a business decision based on data, not just going, well, I think, or my gut's telling me we don't have enough going on. The, the technology is going to show us that. So that was a big reveal for them. So where case study number one was, they were saving money by not having to rely on the option to pull in new cars. That, that was sort of the big reveal that wasn't intended with the platform. But this one, the big reveal that wasn't intended with the platform was it opened up so much from a budget standpoint in the marketing dollars. Of course, this dealership is still going out with their marketing dollars and their strategies, but this allows them to carve that money back into the hires that the staff was asking the, the management team to make. So then they, approved, they, they constantly improve. Those are our case studies, Eliana. Do you want to throw another poll question at everyone based on that one? Okay, let's do it. All right, last poll question, audience, is on your screen now. We'd love it if you give us an answer to this one. How is your dealership currently leveraging the data that it has? Please select one of the following answers. The dealer makes all the business decisions however he sees fit. He doesn't talk to any of us. Don't know if he looks at the data or not, but... Whatever he decides, that's what it is, all right? Management usually looks at data before making some decisions. Sometimes we look at the data, sometimes we don't. Data is used in all of our decision making, always. We live and die by the numbers, or gosh, you know, I don't know, I'm not a decision maker. Once we get a majority of the votes in, we're going to close the poll and share the results. Uh, don't forget, audience, we're going to be getting to the Q&A session very shortly, as well as the giveaway, so you're going to want to stick around for that. But get those questions in so we can help you try and decide what to use your data for. All right, how is your dealership currently leveraging the data that it has? Dealer 
principal makes all the business decisions. He doesn't really check with any of us. <laughs> Management usually looks at the data before making any decisions. Sometimes we look at the data, sometimes we don't. It's a toss-up. Data is used in all of our decision-making, always, or you know what? I don't know. I'm not a decision-maker at the dealership. Um, <laughs> David wrote in, I bet depending on who in the dealership answers this question, you'll get different answers on this one from the same dealership. Well, you're right, you know what? Mm. But that's okay. We just want to know. <laughs> if you know the answer of what happens at your dealership with the data, we, we're dying to know. Because, you know, we know that there's dealerships out there who don't look at any of the data. They just go on a gut feeling or they hear somebody else used it and it was good for them or, you know, I mean, data is not something that everyone utilizes, but it's certainly something everyone has. So... No, it's a, it's a, it's a bigly topic. Oh, wait, <laughs> is that word? It's tremendous. Is that word trending? <laughs> I, oh, dude, huge. Bigly data, You're, no longer big data. It's oh data. my goodness! Yes, all the all the Canadian people are making fun of us down here in America. All right. No worries. <laughs> all right. We're here. not laughing at you. We're just pointing at you. Oh, thanks. Appreciate it. All right, we're going to give you a couple more seconds to answer this one, and then we're going to get started with the answers. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Let's close this poll and share the results. All right, fifteen percent of today's audience say that. Hey, their dealer principal makes all those business decisions, and we don't really, he could roll a dice for all we know. <laughs> all right, a third of today's audience, about 30%, said management usually looks at the data before making any big decisions. 15% of today's audience said sometimes we look at the data, sometimes we don't. Another 30% of today's audience said data is used in all of our decision making, always. They live and die by the numbers. And 10% say they're not decision makers and they really don't know how those decisions are made. Does that help you out? Yeah, that's killer. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, it, it, you know what I mean? It, it's, it's promising, though, to see that you can see that there is a trend of, of teams that are using their platforms and trying to dive into them the best they can. Because you see that 30% there are saying, like, yeah, management usually looks at that data before making decisions or data is used in all our decision making always. It's... Um, it's it's something that stores naturally have to evolve into and continue to keep working at. It's but it's almost it, it, it's it should just become something that is part of the due diligence that happens every single week and every single month. All right, let me close out of this. Thank you, everyone, for your votes. Now get those questions in, and we're going to be moving right along. Where do we go to from here? So, based on the two. Based on the two case studies that I wanted to share with you is, is what can you take away from this and, and what can you take away from learning from case studies about automated technology and, and it, it's quite simple. It, it, the, the takeaway is number one is just don't pull the chute when you've invested the time to onboard a piece of technology in the store. If someone starts to get panicky 30 or 60 days in, let it bake you know, at least for a quarter, at least for two quarters. You've got to let the data start to work for you so you can start to see the proper insights that may be of huge benefit to your dealership. Don't miss out on an opportunity to see something that may change your dealership radically from one aspect or the other. Like Eliana said, maybe it's something where the culture just in the store, the way the store is viewed from the street, right? Like getting people out of the front or saving money on marketing. There's a lot of things that can happen, but don't get panicked if you can't understand what's happening or it's not, it doesn't seem to be working. Stop and regroup with your product coaches. Go back to your vendor because the vendors that will show their worth will spend the time with you and dig in to show you the nuances and the, and the little things you can do inside their, inside their technology that can that can get you really, really big wins. The other thing I want to say is talk to your peers. And the <laughs> reason why I say this, thank you for laughing at that, Eliana. Every time I show this slide, it's just, it's crickets. I, maybe it's a Canadian, British humor <laughs> thing. They don't understand I that. think it's humorous. I'm, I think so too. I'm sure Kevin and Brad are bad enough me on Twitter right now about it. But I think that this is the most important thing because what I came away with with this was Yes, help dealers understand the value of using automated technologies and how it can quiet processes inside your store. 
but I find the biggest thing, and what I always loved about case studies, be it if, if I saw someone talk about an experience they had by using something in their store, and, and I'll, give a, I'll give a great shout out to my friend Kevin Fry, I know who's on the, on the webinar. My early days of going to conferences, and if I went to a Kevin session, Kevin was usually sharing something about their experience at the store level, and I always got a ton of insight and learning out of that. And so that's why I wanted to do this session about case studies because I wanted to share that because at the end of the end of the, the, the session, the end of this presentation, it's not about coming to me and saying, you know, if you want to learn more about this or understand it better, come talk to me, the vendor. No, I would rather have the dealers that sit through this case study specifically go out and talk to the two dealers that I interviewed and I learned from because this is what I feel is most important. Yes, I can tell you the benefits of technology and why you want to use it all day long, but because if you're in it and you're having hurdles or you're before you're getting into it and you want to understand how a friend store might have adopted it and push that adoption through their organization, I think the best thing to do is talk to each other, right? Because you can get insight and education from me all day long, but the thing that's going to get you the biggest part of the win with using automated technology is leverage your friends that are in other stores. And maybe, you know, you have to go a little farther out of your trade area because it's a competition thing, but you've got peers in the industry. Like, don't be afraid to say, you know, we're 30 days into something and for some reason I know your store crushes it with this tool, but for some reason we're not, can I talk to you? Don't be afraid to reach out to each other because sometimes I think our egos overstep our ability to just ask for help. And I think that's huge. So for those dealers that are in the room looking at this today, yeah, you can talk to me all day long and reach out to me for stuff. But really, when it comes to part of what makes these projects and these onboards successful is talk to a peer because I think that's where you'll get the greatest win. And that, my friends, is quiet as the new lab. <laughs> I like it. Action items for everybody. So Eliana made me build this list out, and I'm glad she did because I think the things that you want to take away from this today are simply like I just put, like go out to those dealers. Eliana will have the deck, so you know their 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 information's on there, and both guys are great and super approachable. But do an honest appraisal of your application use, management level first, because again, it's one thing to bring something in, and all the management teams like, yep, we're going to make this work. Be honest about the application use, top down. Does your entire team understand the tech they use? That is action item number two. Constantly ask them. Don't onboard it, get everyone trained. Regroup all the time. Is everyone still on top of this? Does anyone need a little bit of extra training with a product coach? Do it because where you feel it's needed, you've always got, like I said, those vendor relationships. They will prove their worth to you, but you, you know, don't, don't forget to use them and make them help you um, evolve your tools and evolve your data. Like leverage those coaches and their knowledge of the platform. And like I said earlier, and I keep saying it, allow the data to bake in because some strategies definitely need time to, you know, to take to take hold and really show you where those wins are. Okay. Okay. Ask yeah. our expert. <laughs> Big yellow question mark. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Brent. Sit back, okay, relax, take a drink. Sure. We're going to get to those questions in just a minute. I'm going to talk to the audience right now. Audience, we need your questions, so send those questions in. We're going to be getting to the Q&A session in just a little bit. I want to also direct your attention over to the handouts section of today's presentation. Look at the GoToWebinar sure. interface, and over there you're going to see two handouts in there. One of them is the slide deck from Brent Weiss that we just saw. The other one is a research report done by Next Up. So. Uh, very interesting stuff. Brent, did you want to say anything about that second handout? So the second handout, um, Eliana asked me if there was anything that you guys could use for white paper. Um, what I'm finding with that research report is we took a really hard look at why dealerships need to look at moving away from open floor scenarios at their dealerships. So it's a really great report that covers and digs into the different nuances in the culture and process problems that can arise from open floor, but we also, it was, it was done by third party, it was done by, uh, by PCG, and they went out to our, the next up client base and did an independent interview of, of 
different stores. So like I did in this case study, they went out to the stores and said, you know, what did you think you were going to have problems with? Where did you think you were, your pain points were going to be when using the tool? So uh, what I find with that white paper and why I wanted to share it is as I am introducing our platform up here in Canada, while you know, Clinton Mark have done a great job of introducing it down south, I find that the stores that take that white paper and share it actually start to look at their business a little bit differently. So it's, it's a good read, it's a simple read, but it really does, um, uh, really does focus in on open four, which seems to have a lot of conversations happening in social media and in some of the forums right now. All right, so listen, you have until the end of this broadcast to download both of those handouts. Remember, it's the slide deck and then also the, um, the, the research report from our friends over at Next Up. So as long as we're broadcasting, you have the time to, to download the, both of those things. So do that at your leisure. And, oh, it's my favorite time of the day on Thursday. That's right, we're giving away a prize. I love it. Um, hey, uh, B-Dub, you can turn on your webcam if you want. Okay. I'll turn on mine. I'm just, I'm just, I'm looking. I just, I can't, like, I know I'm, I'm, I'm I know I'm, Focusing on him today, but wow, Brad, we're sliding the history of a dealer on webinar. Wow. What's <laughs> it like being a monster? You didn't like your pair slide. All right, but let's get to this. No. It's very exciting. It's that time if you missed it at the beginning of the webinar. I announced that our good friends uh, over at Next Up are giving away an awesome prize today on the webinar. Two of you lucky webinar attendees are going to win a Gorin Brothers virtual hat shopping trip with the hat expert himself, Brent Weiss. Okay, I I'm, not, I'm not kidding. Is there a third one that I maybe could get? Because I am officially jealous about this. So whoever wins this cool prize, hats off to you. <laughs> Joke intended. Uh, okay, get ready. Get to your keyboards. First person to write in the correct response to one of our giveaway questions is going to win this awesome prize today. And yes, I'm going to put it out there. If you are a vendor, we're going to ask you to please sit this one out. This prize is intended for dealership personnel only, but we love you and we're glad you're here. Thank you so much for coming to a dealer on webinar. But here we go. Good luck, everyone. What was the name of the technology that Aurelia Hyundai used in the first case study? Let's see. Who is today's... <laughs> can't. It can't happen. Can it happen? Brad Pascal is our first winner. <laughs> you know, I'm changing the prize. I've got like a half a bag of Fisherman Friends cough drops that Pascal can have. Ooh, you know, you really? guys. That's a joke. Brad, congratulations. The worst dealer on webinar ever. <gasps> That's not true. No, and... not you. It's Brad's ruining it for everybody. <laughs> no, he's not. Brad, we love you. B-Dub, we love you too. Good luck on that shopping trip, you guys. Please. <laughs> Just gentle, gentle rubbing. All right. Uh, Chris oh Vegas is not happy. He said, no, he cheated. There's one more, though. There is one more. There is one There's more. One. Brad, guess what? You're sitting this one out. All right, pal? Can, yeah. I, can I get in on this? No? All right, but guess what, everyone? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. The answer was bumper. Thank you so much, <laughs> David, for keeping me honest. Okay, the answer was bumper. Okay, um, we got one more of these cool hat mm -hmm. shopping trips to give away. So get ready, everyone. Here we go. And good luck, Brad. You're sitting this one out. You're already a winner, my yep, friend. <laughs> All right. I hope you guys are paying attention because this one um, kind of glossed over this. Here we go. In the second case study. How much money did the Toyota store spend every month on television to generate more traffic? Wow, I thought it was hard, but everyone got this one right. Let's see. Yes, the answer was $25,000 a month on right. television. And the winner is Steve Peters. Steve Peters, congratulations. Right. Um, Steve, I think you might be a first-time winner on my show. I don't recall your name coming up on my screen before. So congratulations. And you are both going to be hearing directly from our good friend, B-Dub, about your prizes and when you can set up that virtual shopping trip for both of you. Congratulations to Brad. Yeah, Haskell. really know, guys. I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be awesome. And Steve Peters, congratulations. <laughs> my campaign promise to now everyone. Look, we only had two winners today. 
We, of course, we want to thank both of them. For, thank everyone yes. for playing along. But you know what? We give away cool prizes every week on our Dealer On webinars. So come on back to another Dealer On webinar. And who knows? That could be the day you win a cool prize on a Dealer On webinar. But for right now, we're going to congratulate Brad Pascal and Steve Peters on winning their yes. cool hat shopping trips with Brent Weiss. And of course, we've got to thank our very good friends over at Next Up for their incredible generosity. <laughs> Okay, Brent, Chris wrote in and said, Brad doesn't even wear hats. <laughs> Brad. That's all. i got to go back. Sorry. Brad, if you he don't does. want to wear that hat, it's okay. I will take your hat shopping trip. Trust me. Believe Gordon, me, I will put it Gordon to good Brothers use. has a lot of really cool, well, I know Brad's a big ball cap fan, so they got they have hats for everything, so I, I'm sure we'll, we'll get both guys tricked up. <laughs> Brad's like, I always wear hats. What are you talking about, Chris? All right, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, first question. They, this came in really early on in the show from our good friend Kevin, and he even tweeted this question out, so he really wants an answer to this. He mm. says, Brent, does it make sense to spend money to drive traffic that is not handled properly? Maybe some of that money should be spent on training to handle that traffic instead. Hashtag balance. What do you think, Brent? I I agree, I, and, I, and I think that's why I set that up at the start of it is because that spending um, is, is is the thing that is is the thing that blinds us is the, is the drive to traffic, and I think Kevin's exactly right. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think dealers should be overspending to drive traffic when when you can leverage some of those dollars to absolutely do that to train people the right way. Because if you've got like as Lithia Toyota showed us, they had plenty of traffic, but their staff wasn't evolving to tackle them the right way because they didn't have time because there was too much of it, too much multitasking. So I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. If you've got, if you're optimizing the traffic you have and the right experience and those staff are just on top of their game, I'm, I, I'm wholeheartedly in agreement. I think that money is better spent making sure that everything from, from what's happening digitally and then live in store uh, with your staff, yeah, invest in them because the, the better and better they get, uh, it, it's only going to be a win. And the traffic will flow from that. Like how, how can it not, right? If you've got a store that just has such great experience and, and salespeople that are going above and beyond, that, that's going to circulate on its own and that's going to drive you organic traffic just based on referral. Like I said, talk to each other about where you're having problems, but customer to customer, man, like if if those stores are killing it because they're investing in their people, yeah, you, you don't need to spend money on traffic. Gotcha. All right. Thanks for the great question. We have another one coming up from Kevin in a little bit. We do have a handful of questions to get through before we close out the show, so here we go. This next question sounds like a very frustrated guy here. His name is Andrew, and Andrew says, I guess I have no patience, or maybe I just don't like change, but how long are you asking us to give a new technology to bake? Uh, or give it a shot before we call it quits. No tech works at a hundred percent of the dealerships. Mm. <laughs> I'll say this to it. I'll say that um, each vendor in their platform. So mm -hmm. you know. So for instance, so the guys at Bumper. If you talk to Steve Salvin, who created Bumper, Steve will give you, you know two or three campaigns on that platform will show you whether or not it's working, right, based on the data that it can provide based on the segmenting you're doing. Because again, you have to remember, Andrew, that the technology, if it's working well, is going to go from point A to point B to go, we are going to, the, the tech is going to do this, it's going to deliver you something, and it's going to report it in a way that you can act on it. Um, I think based on different things the vendor will say to you, like, you know, if you talk to Clint or Market next up, they'll say, you know, a, a quarter to six months is something that you want to look at and allow things to happen. I believe that where things, like, yeah, every tech doesn't work 100% of the time because it's, we can't just do the sit back and let the, and let the technology do what it's supposed to well, do. Well, maybe, it's maybe geographically, it. maybe that, where that dealership is located might, I don't know. Well, I, I guess what I'm trying to say with that is, is I understand Andrew's pain of it, but I think sometimes what happens is we we assume beyond what the technology is giving us. A through Z, the technology is going to give you a, a result, right? It's a computer. It's basically taking a bunch of things and doing multiple tasks on your behalf so then you can focus on one thing or do certain 
exercises with the technology. Right. I think where dealers get frustrated, and I think it goes back to what Kevin was saying, is invest in the time with your staff to ensure it's adopted. Because I see great technology all the time fall apart at a dealership because they aren't regrouping it all with it all the time. The management team is sort of going, yep, uh, everyone understands it, and they don't regroup on it. They, they're not looking at it further. And sometimes the reason why a lot of tech fails isn't because your staff isn't using it. It's because ownership and management claim they've adopted it, and they're not following up. They're not ensuring the success of it. And I think that I think it I think it's hand in hand. Is tech perfect? No, right. Tech has its good days and its bad days. But I think the simplicity of a lot of automated technologies nowadays are allowing you to take what you're learning from it, and then you've got to do the human element of it still. Like we, technology only fails because we as humans aren't taking it and, and adopting it the right way and right. putting it out. So Andrew, I, I hope that answers it. And in, in post. We can talk about it more because I, I, I know where you're at with it, and a lot of times when I see things fall apart at dealerships, really it, it comes down to the people and, and it, whether or not they're, they're, they're engaging with it and they're rallying around it the right way. All right. Well, Andrew wrote in. Thank you. Um, okay. next, next question comes in from Allison. She says, in case study two, are you saying they fired people for not logging customers better than others? No, no, no. They didn't. <laughs> they fired everyone. No, um, no. They didn't. They didn't fire. No. They. Um, what they found was is because when they had an open floor, and and that's a great question. So I'll back up. So this store had an open floor, and the phenomena of an open floor is you've got new staff coming in all the time, and you've got senior staff, the you know the vets out there and the sharks out there on the floor that are taking all live opportunities off the floor from new people, and they're not allowing them to try to grow their own databases. So what happened? What was happening with that store was they weren't able to keep a lot of new hires. They were having a lot of turnover, and what was happening with a lot of turnover was while they were all trying to get those fresh opportunities on the sales floor, no one was spending the time at their desks doing the post-visit follow-ups and the logging because they were so panicked about missing opportunities on the floor. And the, what the tool was allowing them to do was give people back their time to go, you only need to be up front grabbing those opportunities, and here's the time at your desk. So when they were on that open floor, things weren't being logged because people were getting panicked about missing opportunities on the floor. They were focused on being out front, standing out in front of the dealership. So it wasn't a fact that they were letting people go. People were walking away from the store. And they were so early in their employment that, the, the, like to Kevin's point about investing in people, investing in training, they didn't have time to like help people get into the CRM and understand it the right way or, or learn it. And, and we were talking about this the other day. And, and just to digress for a second, too many times when we're bringing people on, it's on the vendor side and it's on dealer side as well. We're like, welcome to your new job. Here's your desk. Here's a computer. Try not to cry on your first day. Like that's training and that's onboarding. And I think that's you know it happens with open floor is we send people into the shark den, and you know we send people into this chaotic open floor environment and people leave. So and those stores suffer to that point because data is not being logged the right way because they just don't have time to evolve and really dive into the things right. that will make them successful as a salesperson. So no, they weren't firing people, but people were quitting. People were quitting. Damn. All right. People, they said, they said right, there's been two big reports out that says, like, you know, turnover is still a big problem mm -hmm. in the industry. It is because we, we allow open floors to continue. And while they continue, it's going to keep happening. All right, Allison, thank you so much for the great question. Yeah, All right. thanks, Allison. Let's, uh, um, okay, next question comes in from John. John says, in case study number two, was the TV advertising local, local or cable or what? Do you happen to know that? Um, I'm trying to remember back. I think a lot of it was, uh, I think a lot of it was local, John, but I, I, if you, if you want, I'll try to follow up and get you that exact information from that. All right, let's get to the second question from Kevin. He says, my wife thinks Navy veterans are the best people in the automotive industry. Where does that put Canadians? <laughs> I can't believe he wrote that. He said, you know what? I, I don't, 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 don't bring Julie Fry into this. She's too nice of a person to like, <laughs> even get into this. I'm, I'm, I'm not honoring that question with an intelligent result uh, answer because it's just not going to be taken Sorry. seriously by Kevin Fry. Okay. 
just so you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm also a Navy veteran, but okay. Um, yeah, but you're he, a lot nicer than Kevin. <laughs> he says he's just needling you, Brent, but he does follow up with a serious question, and he says, oh, yes. yeah. is a tool like Next Up best set up to succeed if it is part of the CRM? No, no I, I don't think it is, and I know Kevin and I have had this discussion before. Why I don't think it is is because the, the dealerships have enough, they have enough of, a, of an issue getting their staff to, to sorry, I'm shaking my table, they, they have enough problem getting their staff to log um, in their CRM as it is now. You know, we talk and we've been to a lot of different events lately where, you know, we've seen CRM companies talk that they still only have, you know, 40% adoption or 50% things being logged in the CRM. So if you look at most stores and even even well-producing stores and, and, and well-run stores, they still are trying to get over the hump of having staff get into CRM and log that time. So adding that step into a CRM is just one more thing about trying to get people to do something. The thing about Next Stop is we sit before the CRM and after the marketing, after the drive-in, because the reason why we do that is because for the staff to learn Next Up, they really only have to do an exit strategy after they've talked to the customer. There's no real technical training for a sales staff to actually do the work with Next Up. It's just after they've engaged the customer, they do a little exit survey, which drives into the data. When they're not on point, though, what Next Up is trying to achieve for those dealerships invested in ensuring CRM success is we are showing the time for those staff to sit down and then dive into their CRM. And I know coming from you know a summit a couple of weeks ago, I'm seeing the CRM companies simplify and redesign their environments, which they should because even working on our side, the CRM we use, no CRM is perfect and mm -hmm. it, sometimes it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy to work in it be in it, you know, sit in it, understand it. So personally, I think that because we keep it separate, it can be perceived as not one more thing to learn in the CRM, but just all we're doing for our salespeople is just going, I'm just giving you time at your desk so you can sit quietly and actually log the stuff you need to log in your CRM. And it allows the management staff to help move people into that the right way. So to Kevin's earlier question is, you can invest time to say, hey, you know, you're behind in your logs based on what Next Up is telling us. How can we help you improve that? Are you having trouble in it? Do we need to get you to a product coach? Instead of just lumping more features into one platform, let's get them let's get them utilizing the platform they have the right way by giving them time at the desk. So I, I keep it separate for them. All right. All right. Kevin, thank you so much for the great question. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question comes in from Joe. Uh, we only have two questions left, by the way. So next yep. question comes in from Joe. It says, uh, is it your belief that dealerships should always look at data before making a marketing move or using a new technology? Is there no room for just a gut feeling? No. But I think, <laughs> no. I, but here, I'll say this, Joe. I'll say this. I, I, I Absolutely not. Um, I, I think if you're going to, if you, I think where you make a gut decision, Joe, though, is like, yeah, you have you have to use the data, right? Like, I just if you're going to go into if you're going to build a strategy for your marketing and you're not using data to do it, like, there, there's ground zero for that. You've got to start somewhere, and you've got to build a strategy and start to move through it and start to see what's returned via the data. You have to adopt a piece of technology at like at day one and let it build for you. But I think where you make your, where dealers and salespeople still have to use their guts is when you've got the person in now, if the strategy and the technology is allowing that customer to get in front of you faster or allowing you to provide a better experience for them, mm -hmm. then you as a business person, as a seasoned professional, as a, as a sales expert, you're going to, you're going to then use your gut because you're face to face with the person, right? You're face to face with that. And I think that's where or when you're looking at a piece of technology, I think the gut is, I'm going to go out and ask someone who's already on it. Like I think person to person, there's still valuable insight that's based on gut and just communicating back and forth with someone. But, I, but honestly, like if, if we're still moving through, there's so much good information that's being provided to us. The fact that we're, if you're not leveraging that, you're just burning money. So I hope that helps. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Last question from a very patient Heidi. Hi, Heidi. Glad you could be Hi, part Heidi. of the show. Heidi says, 
Brad? <laughs> no. Heidi says, it's like pulling teeth to get old school sales consultants to try anything new. And we've had this question before on many different other topics as well. So Brent, what is your best advice to get old school sales consultants to try something new or some new piece of technology or something new that they have to add on to their old school selling techniques? Um, it, it's, it's so interesting because like, you know, I, I see it with, with different pieces or different things. Um, I think there's, there's a, there's a, part of me wants to just say this. It's like, you know what, if you've got staff making hard business decisions on behalf of the organization, like if you've got someone who, who is a, you know, a salaried staff member who's not paying any mortgage, who's not paying staff benefits, who's not a vested man, like a vested owner of that business, why are you allowing them to continue to to make their decisions on how they're going to run their stuff? And I think that's where we have that's where culture problems happen because new staff look at those older staff saying, "Well, if they're not doing it, then why do I have to do it?" And it happens all the time. So the part of me wants to get real militant about it and say, like, you just you just can't allow that to keep happening because we're allowing the lunatics to run the asylum. <laughs> However. <laughs> it's true though, right? It's because you, we, there's this, you know, dealerships and dealer groups want to create a culture and they want to create an experience. So, you know, you've got a guy who's been around 35 years, but, you know, he, old or young, he's got, he's, he's got a piece of technology he uses every day, right? So it's not that he can't learn stuff because he learned how to use an Android or he learned how to use his iPhone if he's got one. And most of us do have that technology. You know, he goes home and he streams or she streams Netflix. So I, I, I understand Heidi's pain point, but, we are allowing people to tell us that, you know, we're going to do things the way we've always done it because it works for me. And I think, unfortunately, for those stores, it's there has to be that shift of, and it goes back again to, you know, um, investing in your people is you can invest in those senior people to go, you know what, I'm going to help you get better with the technology and training through it if you feel that there's a fear there. And it's just an insecurity. They don't want to do stuff because they feel there's failure or it's going to take away money from them. And most of these environments don't do that at all, right? There's this misconception that is going to hurt their bottom line and their take home. But, it, it, but again, a lot of it's based in fear that they're not going to understand it and they're not going to be able to do it. So try to take a stance with some of these people to go, you know what, why don't we help you understand and leverage technology and the things we want us, we want to do as an organization across it. And let's utilize what you know as a veteran where you can mentor new staff. But, you know, if they're going to continue to say, I'm doing things my way and, you know, organization be damned, Mm -hmm. that, that's a tough call and, and I, I know there's a couple of dealer friends of mine up here that have had to make some really bold decisions because they've had staff say to them, well I'm going to sell cars for you and I'm going to get my, my pay plan from you but I'm not going to touch e-leads because I don't believe in them. You know, like that's, you know, like let's all just stick a gun in our mouths and blow our brains out. You know, like it's just, I, I just think it's crazy that we still allow that and I, and I know, but the double-edged sword is I also know that we are trying to get people hired into our environment so we can grow our business and it's it is tough to find good people and bring in people so you have to keep that so it's that it's that almost like workshop environment where it's almost you have to do sort of a like a like a like a workshop or something about this is how we want to evolve and maybe that's just more of if you if you take your people and you take your group and you include them in sort of this new, we're going to build a strategy together and we're going to work through this pain point together. Maybe you can get those older staff there, but I, I get it because I see it all over the place. I was just at a dealership that have guys that are maybe a year out from retiring. Um, mm. And again, they, they feel that they can't do that stuff or they don't want to do it. Again, it's just a matter of you, you, have, to, you have to honestly check your gut and, and, and see that whether or not long term for the business plan that this is worth it. And I think some of these guys come around. You know, I think we're afraid to have tough conversations with people and, and we're all built that way. We're all empathetic and we all we're all caring people. But I think sometimes it's just a matter of sitting down and being being honest with one another and practicing a little bit of rigorous honesty to say this is how we want the, the environment to evolve. This is how we want the experience to evolve. We need everyone to be on the same page and we have to move that way. And I think some people are going to go find other places to work and some people will 
will evolve. But I think we're we're just not we're not challenging them enough. We're 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 tiptoeing around it. Um, but we don't have to be tyrant about it either. Like we don't have to be tyrants about it. You don't have to have come to Jesus meetings or like you know lay the gauntlet. But I think it's I think there's a bit of um, quiet honesty that we can have with those people and say this is how things have to start moving. But you can do it. All right, Heidi. I hope that helps okay. you out. <laughs> Very sage advice from our friend up north, Brent Weiss, with Next Up. Thank you so much, Brent, for being here. You did not disappoint me, my friend. <laughs> Okay, for those people who aren't on the live broadcast and watching the playback, that's Brent Weiss holding up a sign that says, Make Brad Great Again. Make Brad Great Again. Referring to, of course, our friend Brad Pascal, who, by the way, is always welcome on my show, even though he doesn't like my Eagles, my Philadelphia Eagles. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Brent Weiss. Um, take anyway. care. Have a great day. Fantastic presentation. I want to remind the audience that a link to download a copy of this webinar recording is going to be emailed to you in just a little bit. Let me get it posted online for you. And you will be able to find it online within 24 hours. All you have to do is go to dealeron.com slash webinars. And from there, you can view our upcoming webinar schedules or access any of our past webinars as well. And at the conclusion of this webinar, in just a minute, you're going to get a short survey, real short, six questions. We'd love it if you'd take part in our survey. We want to know what you thought of today's presentation. So please give us your feedback. It means a lot to us. Oh, and by the way, Brent Weiss will also be presenting at the upcoming Driving Sales Executive Summit in Vegas next week. He's going to be talking about yeah. why marketing to millennials is for suckers. <laughs> so if you're going to be there, you're going to want to check that out. Also want to let you know that Sean Rains and Greg Gifford of Dealer On will also be both be presenting at the upcoming Driving Sales Executive Summit as well. So stop by, say hi, looking forward to seeing you there. And I'm giving out participation medals at mine. So everyone who comes, we're going to all get participation medals. I kid you not. It's going to be pretty epic. So awesome. All right. Invitations will be going out tomorrow for our next Dealer On webinar next Thursday. Five next level video strategies to sell more cars. Studies have proven that video added to an email gives a far more emotionally compelling message and video added to a dealer website boosts engagement by providing virtual test drives. In fact, there has been a 220% increase in year-over-year -year growth in auto video watch time. So, let's add this up. If car shoppers love watching auto videos and car shoppers only visit 1.2 dealerships before buying a car, every dealership should be asking themselves, what video strategies do I need to do to get shoppers to visit my dealership? In this compelling one-hour webinar, Mr. Video himself, Phil Sura, will focus on five specific video strategies you can implement immediately to improve your organic search results, website conversion, and video pre-roll effectiveness. This advanced session will focus on best practices and case studies from dealers that are successfully using video tools to drive sales. Additionally, if you're ready to learn the five new next level video strategies to sell more cars, then this is a presentation that you simply can't not miss. So register now and don't forget DealerOn's weekly webinar are held Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, and 9 a.m. Pacific. And if you have questions, comments, or suggestions regarding the Dealer On webinar series and our topics, hey, contact me directly. I'd love to hear from you. I'm everywhere. I'm all over. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, Google+. I'm on every automotive social network. Or, you know what? You, yeah, I know. I'm on there, too. You can email me directly at eliana at dealeron.com. I'd love to hear from you. So don't be shy. She's got a GeoCities website. <laughs> I want to thank you all so very much for spending this time with us today, and I hope to see you all on another webinar in our continuing education series. Take care. See you, everybody. Thanks for coming.